Thank you so much all for coming. Welcome. Hello, everyone. Uh, we'll Real start. people. Yeah. So exciting. Inside. <laughs> Inside. It's so great Can't to be back smiling. in the chamber. Yeah, with all of you today. Um, I'll start with a, a sort of basic question. Who gets called a difficult woman? <laughs> you have. <laughs> Me. I mean, I've interviewed Gina before, so. But you, I mean, the stuff that you got called for pointing out that the UK, sorry, we're getting into things quite quickly already. <laughs> the UK couldn't unilaterally make those EU citizens, um, not EU citizens, you know, your legal argument. Well, tell us some of the well, worst well, things you were called. I was gonna say, being called a difficult woman That's is, a compliment. is actually, yeah, it's actually yeah. about minimalist <laughs> in the abuse I get. Um, and whenever I'm asked this question about, because it's normally bloody difficult woman, that's the, you know, we've, that's always the one that comes first. Um, and I think, the opposite. Who wants to be a bloody easy woman? Exactly. I mean, <laughs> we, well, <that laughs> you think about it, that has a completely different connotation. So I think I'll stick with that one. But um, it's, it's, um, uh, it's really interesting because I think it's the appropriation of language to try and censor women. That's what is really going on in all of this. Um, and censorship in a way. And um, you've just, as far as I'm concerned, if I, in, in any of my campaigning for 30 years, if anybody starts abusing me or calling me names, and I sort of know I've already won the argument, because if they really disagreed with, with the content of what I was saying and could intellectually respond, that would be where they'd go. But if they already start name calling, then I sort of think to myself, right, I'm already winning the argument, so I'm just gonna stick to the argument. And it actually glosses over me completely, but, it is about censorship. I mean, there, I don't know if you, any of you here know, um, there was a, a 1969, I think, Joe Freeman, the American activist, did, um, she wrote something called the Bitch Manifesto, in which she said, we'll never make change unless we embrace the bitch in us. And societal change is about making people unhappy. Uh, and uh, that's sort of where it comes from, I think. But it's a shame that, you know, that was 1969, that up to now, women are still being given those labels, if they are seen to step out of place, isn't it? It's all about know your place, putting you back, censoring you. And I'm sure we'll get on social media and all the rest of it, but yeah, yeah. It's, um, it's about censorship. I think there are two interpretations. One is, is the one you're talking about, keeping women in their place, which the, the current usage has come about, or, I mean, the current popularity for the phrase difficult woman is because the con former Conservative Chancellor, Tory politician called Ken Clark, now Lord Clark of summer or other, um, uh, said of Theresa May and was recorded as saying, she's a bloody difficult woman, you know. He didn't think the mic was on. Yeah. No. Remember? Yeah. Exactly. Like, it, was yeah. Like John, it was just like John Major being recorded talking about the bastards in his cabinet, you know, who were the pro-Europeans. Um, and he said, she's a bloody difficult woman. Now, I, I've, I've known, I've worked at the House of Commons for something like nearly half a century. Um, I know Ken Clark extremely well. Um, and I can just hear him say the phrase. And also I can hear half the House, House of Commons saying she's a bloody difficult woman about any woman who takes the trouble to stand up for themselves. And that brings me to the other point, which I think is where Rachel's coming from. And we'll hear from, from her in a minute, I'm sure, on this theme. And Rachel's new podcast about difficult women is um, about women who are prepared to say no. I, why should I? I'm not going to. And, and who have got somewhere in consequence, like Gina has, and I've got somewhere, in, I suppose, in terms of a career, that's all. I mean, I, I was the first woman political editor of a national newspaper. I was the first woman to chair the parliamentary lobby. Um, and I've done a few other things like that. But I, I didn't sort of set out to be difficult. I wasn't coming here this evening. Um, various people said, what, what are you doing at the auction? Oh, God, debating at the auction, you know, my word. And I said, no, it's a conversation. And they said, what on? And I said, difficult woman. And they, the, all the people I said that to said, but you're not a difficult woman. And as you can see, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, we're not allowed to call you ladies and gentlemen anymore because you get, you get, anyway, whoops, careful. Um, it's transphobic. <laughs> um, as you can see, I am the soul of reasonability. I think that I think actually Julia makes a really good point. Um, I mean, when I, my father gave the speech at my wedding, 
I've, so far I've only been married once, so my one and only wedding. And he gave it to me afterwards and I found it in a box the other day. And in the speech, he said, um, my family call me Rake and actually I published a memoir last year on the 19th of March, and we went into lockdown on the 23rd of March, so nobody bought a single copy. And then it came out in paperback on the 19th of October, and we went into another lockdown on the 24th, so nobody bought even the paperback either. But anyway, it was called Rake's Progress because my family nickname is Rake, okay, because my name is Rachel. And anyway, I found this wedding speech, and it said, Rake has always been a piece of cake, i.e. I've never been difficult in the family. And I think that was, was that a compliment or did it just suggest that as a female child, I had been brought up to be compliant? It might have suggested there are more difficult people in your family. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, I think that we were all brought up not to make a fuss, not to make trouble. And therefore when I got, when it got to adult life, I felt yippee, you know. You, you. You, you know, every single day of my adult life, I have regarded as a bonus because we have autonomy. However circumscribed our lives are as women, and I actually think that women in this country are very lucky. On International Women's Day, I always think of the women in Saudi Arabia who aren't allowed to drive, who have to have their brother's permission to leave the country. I think of uh, the women in El Salvador who are put in prison if they have a miscarriage. I think of you know all the things that we, we, we know still go on. And I also think of women in America. You know, Roe v. Wade is coming under attack tonight from the Supreme Court. This week, we've seen the conservative majority in the Supreme Court maybe take away that fundamental right of a woman's right to choose um, up to a certain point in her pregnancy. I think it's 15 weeks. These fundamental freedoms, we can never take for granted. Um, but for centuries, there have been difficult women who've created the societal change. You know, the yes, ability to vote, to get divorced, to study, to work. You know, it has been, you know, centuries of difficult women who have created that change. Women who have but, you know, it's yeah. not the only women, but, but I, I think one of, it's getting beyond the label. I think we do need to get beyond the label because if you get obsessed with being called that, you know, I haven't got a problem, I have to say, I haven't got a problem with equality, with men being called difficult, but it's not very often that you hear that. It's a bit like the newspapers when they have, you know, a celebrity or a royal going out, you'll have every item of clothing for the female person with a At tag of, 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 no, no, it'll be how much they cost, what label it is. Have you ever seen a man no. where they put that, you know, the label of what they're wearing and how much it's cost? It's not, it's or about how many equality. children they've got. Or how many got. children they've yes. got, or how many times they've divorced. You know, it's about equality. I haven't got a problem if they will do it, but it just miss, should be Equal. But the, the, the fact is, it's what is, the, um, what is the purpose of these labels? And I think that's where we need to get to. It is, as you it's say, the limitation. But, it's putting you in your But in a, in, in a world where women, it, we are increasing, we're seeing an increase in that misogyny and that abuse and that labeling, negative labeling of women um, in public life. I mean, the last election, 2019, um, 19 MPs did not stand again yeah. because of the abuse they get and the names they get called. Yes. And then you bring in but social media and all that language of it. The difficult women bit is only the start of it. Can I just add, add a factual point? Then more women MPs were elected to replace them. So yes, it didn't can, cause yeah. a, a sort of dissipation out from Parliament. There are now more women MPs than there ever were. But it's because of their experience. And now you're seeing in last, we've actually had three new MPs, female MPs, who've now stepped down, yeah. who've decided that they can't put up with it. It's when they enter that arena. Yeah. Um, and I think it's, you know, I've seen it even before the sort of small p political stage or platform, having worked in the city since 96, you know, that, uh, that <laughs> the misogyny and the name calling, you know, I've been called much worse than difficult woman in that arena because I've challenged the way the city works and a lot of the things that they're doing, which I think are wrong and led to the financial crisis. But it's in any walk of life, it's that labeling. And I think it's us sort of not getting hung up on it and moving on because for me, it is about accepting that you are going to be, if you put yourself out there and you're going to be a change maker, you're gonna get called names, so what? Just move on. It's not, you know, if, if you, you know, if, if I get called difficult, aggressive, and I, I'll go, and? But let's be positive. I think, I think we are getting, getting past that. I mean, we are getting to a, a position now where women are accepted for, for uh, having achieved, for having secured their position, and 
are not necessarily branded. I wouldn't say on social media. I mean, the statistics on social media no, no, social, are absolutely uh, horrendous. I'm not talking about social media. I just meant for, for achievement. It is not, it is not remarkable um, to have, um, you know, get it, improving the number of women on boards, for example, in the city. I think the point you make about women in politics and the, the abuse they get is just terrible. I mean, I don't mean your point is terrible. I mean, the abuse they get is terrible. <laughs> and, and you are quite right. There, there are a lot of people who do not um, put themselves forward because they, they just feel they can't take that degree of, of insult. And you would know but more about this having, having I know, been sub subjected to the most yeah. appalling. Can I pick up that point on women on boards? Actually, in the, FT, in the FTSE 100, there's one female um, CEO, uh, head of a company, and, and actually the uh, majority Karen of McCall, yeah, the, the, a lot of the women who I was just going to make the point about the the women on boards. A lot of the women who went on boards went on as Neds, and that was not a true board position. Yeah, I'm a Ned, um, and uh, yeah. you know, and it what means they're you finding, do unpaid work, so it's, it's a non-exec director, and it means you do all the work. You don't really and get the period get, in recognition. You don't get any pay. No, you don't get. Oh, you no, get not for my two boards. <laughs> you mean I can get paid? <laughs> you say I should have been asked. Um, but but the thing is, a lot of the women I've spoken to don't want to take. Don't would not take on another board uh, Ned um, role because of the abuse and the exclusion and the experience they've had of doing that role, which is which is a pity. Um, but it's again, it's you know we, we we have come a very long way, but we have more to do. And one of my particular um, worries is because of going on to social media, is that we now have a, a channel which is amplifying the misogyny and hatred of women. And if you look at you know, the last um, amnesty report on this, you know that in, in the US, 82% of women have changed their behavior online. And in the UK, it's 78% of women who've changed their behavior. They're censoring themselves online. And I, to me, that's wrong because of the, work, the names they're being called and the abuse they're getting. And so we do have to do something about the names, name calling, if you like. Well, for some women, especially on social media, the term difficult women and other similar terms have become almost a badge of honor and something that they wear with pride. Do you think that's yeah. the right way of approaching the situation? I love the t-shirt. It was at the Forces Society who they did. did. They, they, did. They, they, they made a t-shirt, difficult women. Um, and I actually did get a badge called bloody difficult women because it was Mrs. May myself because soon after I got called it too and I, I got a badge made. Um, uh, I think you embrace it and move on. Because yeah. in a way, if you, those who are, I think, in, in all forms of, of abuse, I think you, if you give oxygen to the haters, then they in some way win and I won't let that happen. So I tend to just sort of dismiss them, <laughs> embrace it and move on. Yeah, I mean, I've had no, so far, so good. I mean, I've had no difficulty in getting women to do the podcast, which only launched a few weeks ago. But originally, I think LBC had an idea or I suggested the um, title Iron Ladies. And I don't think that, I think I would have really struggled to get Julia Langdon, you know, who worked for a left-leaning newspaper, to do a podcast called Iron Sunday Ladies. Telegraph. Sunday Telegraph. <laughs> oh, well, that was an aberration, Julia, in your long it? career. Yeah, it wasn't. Okay, no, because as, as a journalist, you're, you're yeah, neutral. I'm a, I'm you're a political neutral. journalist. No, and the fact do that like I can be political, political editor of the Daily Mirror to... and the Sunday Telegraph is a measure of my... Shows your breadth as it's well. It's a measure of my... And your versatility. Exactly. And but my pretty political impartiality. Priti Patel replied to my text saying, please do do my podcast. Um, you know, me, I was thrilled, you know, on the same day. I'd love to do it. I love the title. Um, and she liked it because, you know, home secretaries have a, a really tough gig, obviously. And, you know, she's got the hardest department to manage. I mean, she has to be difficult. Doesn't she? Yeah. The point about Iron Ladies, though, I've just, um, there's a book out oh, yes. called The Prime Ministers, and I did Mrs. Thatcher, uh, the chapter on Mrs. Thatcher, in Rachel's colleague Ian Dale is the editor of this, of this book on Prime Ministers. And um, Mrs. Thatcher was labelled the Iron Lady um, by the Russians, or then the Soviet Union, and actually they were trying to say, um, what's that weapon of torture called? The Iron, Iron Maiden. 
which was, you know, where you, t you t and they were trying to say she was a weapon of torture. I'd called her the Iron, um, okay. and, but it was translated as Iron Lady. And she loved it. And she thought, absolutely brilliant. So what does she do? She buys a red dress and yeah. dashes off to Kensington Town Hall to the Kensington, Kensington Conservatives and says, I'm the Iron Lady, you know, get me. She loved it. I wanted to pick up on this. Yeah, I wanted to pick up on this point about women censoring themselves. I mean, we have a lot of young women in the audience tonight. Is that something that you struggle with? Are we going with? to be taking questions? Yes, we will. Um, so do prepare your questions for later. Um, is that something that each of, each of you struggled with, sort of the, the fear of whether or not to do what you're about to do in your careers? Or uh, My problem is I, I don't self-censor. Um, <laughs> And it's very hard now. I have a two and sometimes three hour radio show. And you can imagine during cancel culture times we live in, um, doing, for example, on Sunday night, the, um, the demonstrations in North London against uh, the Jews from the Palestine. the Palestine demonstrations. And I had to manage calls on that. And I, you know, you are aware that in this climate, any single one word you say, can lead to, to you losing your job. Uh, so self-censorship is very, very important at the moment. Um, as a person, I'm not, I'm quite forthright and frank. I mean, Gina is the same. And I think it's quite, I don't like the fact that we have to check ourselves, but luckily at LBC, there are two buttons on the left, to the left of the, my desk. One is cough, so if I'm going to, I want, in my first show, I was eating a pack of crisps and had the biggest coughing fit I'd ever had. And I didn't know the cough button existed. So the producer came in and said, I need to show you two buttons. I can't believe you don't know this. Cough, so you can go. <laughs> and then there's one called dump. So if somebody says something, something offensive, you just got offensive or libelous or mentions a company or you know, attacks somebody personally who is not there to defend themselves, you can dump, dump them off. I recommend it to everybody. <laughs> I was going to say, I, I don't tend to censor what I'm saying. I'm, I think about what I'm going to say, and I stick to my point of view, and I won't shout down somebody else. Um, I would prefer to have... I quite often go into situations where I know I'll be with people who don't agree with me, because I think it's important that we have those conversations, and you're not censored, but you're sensible, and you're truthful and honest, because we can't go through society just having a singular view or talking to just those who, did, who agree with us. That's because we, we Because we don't <laughs> grow. No, 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 I will actually very politely, if someone has just threatened to rape me, I will send them, I think, dear whoever they are, and answer them and say, could you just, now you've got out of that, you've got that anger out, what is it that you wanted to tell me? And it's quite extraordinary how people are confronted with that. Or if, I, if someone calls me a monkey, I'll go, you know, in the street I was walking along the other day and someone said, bitch, you know, you're just like a monkey, why don't you go back to the jungle? And I said, I just stopped and I said, actually, I'm a great fan of monkeys. I really think they're gorgeous creatures. But um, which particular um, jungle were you thinking that I came from? And he just sort of, Ugh. I mean, because I, I think it's really important that I, I won't censor myself, but I will censor other people by not letting them get away with abuse. But I, it's the way I do it. And I, and it's really, I have learned, it's, it's something you can learn, because you, I've learned to deal with abuse in a particular way where I think I benefit from it, but so does the other person, and because I won't let those small things go away. Uh, so, um, but it's something I've learned, and, and the good news is you can learn it. When I first started, I used to shake before I was responding, if I was going to respond like that. Now I just take a breath, breathe, and then I will respond. Dina, didn't you actually have personal security at... For, so, for three years, yeah. yes. Um, you know, it, so that's it, very brave of you, actually, to, to talk to somebody who's abusing you in the street. But I think it's important because they don't know me. And then, then all that happens is they carry on with the, with the thought that's in their head that I must be this bitch, I must be this difficult woman. Whereas when I respond, you know, it breaks that thought process because I think then if you, unless you confront somebody, unless you do You that, have to be so you have to be. brave, though. I'm, I'm, yeah. Somebody told me once that when someone had threatened to rape her, she said, yes, yes, and what are you going to do next? <laughs> but, uh, and, and, but that's but, what I mean, you learn to yes, do it. But you, learn you, have to do to, it. you must have to be so brave. I, 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 do, I, I do it because I do it because I'm a product of my of lots of failures and bad, of of you know the consequences of my life, which means that I think I have a responsibility now 
for maybe other pe women or men who are not so brave. And because I happen to be me and, and I am in the place I'm at now and I don't have anybody that I have to answer to, both from a business point of view or politically, whatever, then I, I have great freedom to be, to be able to confront people. And I do feel it's a duty that I have to do that. Do you think that the responsibility should be on women or is on women because there's nobody else to bear that burden? No, it's on everyone. I want my son and my, and my husband and my brothers to all stand up for me too. I don't want to be the only one who are doing it. We should all stand up for each other. It can't just be on women. And in linking that into social media, we've seen huge communities of uh, sort of women online at growing feminist channels and all that kind of thing. But we've also seen, like you said, a growth in abuse of women. Do you think that social media will uh, sort of help the progress of, of women and, and women's empowerment, or do you think it will ultimately hinder that movement? Isn't Facebook doing something uh, currently to address the amount of abuse on social media? I'm, I mean, I'm not, I don't do Facebook particularly. I try not to look at Twitter, especially after I've done anything on television, because people just <laughs> yeah, say, Boris no in a wig. Yeah, yeah, Does true. Rachel Johnson go to a 70s hairdresser? Um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's, it's, it's no it's, it's, you mustn't do it. Never put your name into social media, essentially, is my first rule of life. Um, it's just a cesspit if you do that. It's like, it's like, a form of self-abuse. And don't, don't let us forget men get abused too. I, I am not, I don't do Twitter. No, I, I don't have time. So how do you find, how do you know men are getting abused? Because I have a friend, I want friends who do get abused. I mean, um, uh, you know, who, who, who are on Twitter, who, who feel the need to respond to people and then get into, I, th I think it, well, you all, I'm sure you guys all, all tweet, you know, you know, but they get into a row with somebody. And, um, you know, I mean, one of my men friends who's a well known journalist had another well known journalist saying he was oh, going yes, to come around and kill him. I know who you're <laughs> talking about yeah. Mike White and Giles Corrin. That's exactly yeah. so. Mike's yes. Standing up and saying something somebody doesn't agree with result in a death threat or a rape test. I mean, we have, it is completely absurd that we're in a society where that seems to be, you know, is a normal response. Um, you know, we have to get to a place where we can talk to each other. Well, it, it, it's because of the presence of social media. I mean, in the 70s, I mean, if you wanted to abuse a woman, you had to, I, I, you know, go to a park or go to a pub and chat her up or, or attack her in the street. But now it's terribly easy. You can just get out your phone and do it and send something off within a few seconds. I think we'll, second. we'll probably end up going off it topic. Amplifies, <laughs> no, um, the social media obviously amplifies every single disagreement and unpleasant thought you've, you've ever had and gives well, it... A, well, I'm, I'm campaigning at the moment on the online safety bill because I think it, there are big gaps in it. I've, you know, I campaigned all of last year for it to be brought back into this uh, parliament this year, not in the original yeah. 2024. So you know, we were successful in bringing it back, but we haven't seen the draft bill yet, but I am very concerned that there are lots of gaps in it because, you know, you, we now have a toxic Twitter environment or social media platforms. Because if you think about it, the, so you talked about the um, six cars are going through North London, um, the yeah, Palestinian yeah. Uh, protesters, you know, shouting out to young well, Jewish women, daughters, yeah, yeah. Well, to the to the young women uh, walking along, you know, North London and, and Hampstead, and. Every MP suddenly jumped up and started talking about it and defending it, saying how horrific it is. That happens in its millions online. I mean, just because, you know, online, online should be treated the same as it is offline. And that's where I think, you know, we've got platforms that are poisonous environments where people are walking their lives and having to check themselves, where these platforms are earning billions with impunity. And where is it, you know, where's the responsibility? So there has got well, to be a duty of care. And, there's the block and report. You know, but if you have not, a rape no, threat, I'm sorry, you can They do have that. more duty of care than that. They have yeah. to have more duty of care than that. But, but I think there is, you know, if we're going to live our lives virtually and online, which we are, then oh, there okay. has to be, we, 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 we're more and more of our person, lives yeah. are. Thank you for coming in person, everybody. <laughs> what does it feel like? Is it good? Yeah? But no, there has to be rules offline. Yeah. If, if more of our lives are online, then we have to have those same rules online. There are regulations. I remember when Twitter online. started and I first joined, somebody, some very, very wise person said something to me. Um, you are publishing a tweet. You are responsible for this tweet. Imagine you have, you have written this tweet and it's going around a ticker tape on t Times Square. Mm -hmm. Every, so it's not, it's not just to Gina Miller, mm -hmm. it's to the world. And actually, somebody I was in the Big Brother house with, I, I, 
never thought I'd say those words in this chamber, um, who was a contestant on Celebrity, no, not on Celebrity, apparently, on The Apprentice, called Andrew Brady, who then became engaged to Caroline Flack. I hope, do you know who I'm talking about? Who is, com, com, uh, we are not allowed to say she lost her life. She, what did she say instead of committed suicide now? There's a whole, died by suicide. Died by suicide. Um, she took her own life last year. And uh, he thought that she had been driven, partly driven to her suicide by social, the media. social media and, the, and tabloids. And he started attacking a journalist on social media, one particular journalist. And he went to prison and he was in prison last week for that. I mean, there are serious consequences. Well, he, he was the former boyfriend. Andrew Brady yes. was in prison um, in Doncaster last week and he's out on bail. So these things have, you, you say that it's as if it doesn't matter because it's online. No, this is no, no, real life. I'm saying it Sorry. does matter. So what I'm it saying is people's, these, this stuff, because it's online, it's just as no, no, it is. It's, it's legally, legally actionable as if it was in the street is what I'm saying. Somebody I know actually was in prison last week for having threatened a journalist on Twitter, which gives you pause for thought, doesn't it? Because think of all because those people. Because of my case, was, I set the yeah. precedent. So because you, I is took some, prison because, you? because, yes, yeah, because I took, I've got two people I took to court, one on Facebook and one online. And actually the one I didn't win, which I got a 200 pound um, uh, awarded, was uh, a, a, for five months, GoFundMe had a fundraising page, which the headline said, um, uh, raising 10,000 pounds to hire a hitman to kill Gina Miller. That was actually up for five months. And, and their algorithm apparently didn't find that, kill, murder, hitman, I mean, whatever. I mean, it is quite extraordinary. And um, I took that one to court and the platform got off scot-free because it's not registered in the UK, it's registered in LA. Um, and the perpetrator um, got a 200 pound fine for my distress that that caused me. And that was it. So, I mean, it is quite crazy, but the people, how toxic this is all getting. But I think in the bigger point, it's not just about women. I mean, I, my eldest daughter has got special needs. You know, she's a, a 33-year-old young woman with special needs. And the stuff, not, it, people don't know she's my daughter. But when she was on Facebook, um, she's no longer on Facebook. But when she put up that she had special needs and the things that she got sent and the abuse, and I had to try and close down her page. Um, you know, she should be, you know, um, it was absolutely disgusting, the sexual abuse and everything she got. Um, but when I, because she, she, her mental age is only five or six, and she couldn't remember her password. So I tried to close down her page, mm -hmm. and they wouldn't let me because said, she said, they said she was over 18. So I know it took me, months and months for them to do that. I mean, there has to be a responsibility here. There has to be responsibility when it comes to not to vulnerable people. And when we get back to this idea of difficult women, not all women or whoever it is, not everyone has the strength of character or personality to stand up against bullies and against abusers. So there has to be, we have to look out for each other and there has to be rules and regulations in place that we, we you know, that means that we look out for each other because not everybody can be that strong. There are people, you don't know what someone's going through at that point in their lives. They might be going through depression, they might be, you don't know where they are in their lives at that moment. And they might not be able to handle the abuse and the labeling that they're getting at that moment. So we have got to have a more compassionate society when you, it comes. You did have a man sent to prison though, did you not? For I had a Viscount who yes. got, went sent to prison and I had, an, and I had eight cease and desist. Oh no, no, I've had, I keep setting precedents in law because, you know, <laughs> online they said, no, the laws weren't actually capable, which is why he, yeah. But it, it, no, it's not going far enough. That's a, there's a lot of, a lot of legislation was in place before, you know, technology and digital, and so they need updating. But that, that again is another, there's, there's hundreds of laws that need to go through that process. Away from social media, I mean, all of you have worked in places that could be reasonably um, described as the establishment. I mean, um, Gina and, and law and, um, parliament and even in the lady magazine what advice would you give to women who are trying to forge their way in the workplace and maybe feel that their womanhood is used to sort of knock them down or knock them back um, I just want to say one thing I mean I talked about that 
past somebody who went to prison and probably shouldn't have done. So I'm, also, I'm now self-censoring because I don't really know the ins and outs of that case. So I just want to put, leave that there. Um, I think it's, I have a daughter of 26 and it's extraordinary. I mean, when I, in my first year at the FT, I joined, I, I left Oxford and I went as a graduate trainee to the Financial Times at the same time as another Oxford graduate in my year and I discovered after a year that his salary had been bumped up by about sort of 3,000 or something, and mine hadn't been. And I remember having, feeling very righteous indignation and going into the managing editor's office and um, saying, why did you put up John, because he, he was actually called John, John's salary and not mine? And the managing editor couldn't cut, reach for that usual argument, which is that he's got a wife and kids to support, because we were both 23 or 24. And he looked at me and it was as if he had understood something for the very first time in his life, that, there should, that you should actually apply the Equal Pay Act of 1970. With my own daughter, I, who's immensely grounded and competent young woman, you know, she dreads me saying this, but I say to her, you know, you got a promotion, did you ask for a pay rise? And she goes, well, no, it's, you know, the pay thing is done separately. And I'm sure, you know, the other, it, it will happen sort of later in the year. And I go, it won't, <laughs> you know. So I always, whenever I do any events at any schools or anything, I used to have, my phrase would always be, be pushy to women. Absolutely. I mean, it's one of these, pushy is a word that when it's applied to women means uh, she, she's asking for something that men take for granted, essentially. It's like feisty means a woman who doesn't let men talk over her. Um, bossy means a woman who tells somebody what they should be doing in their job. Uh, you know, <laughs> nagging is asking, some, asking a man to do something that he said he would do. You know, these are, these are words that are completely derogatory, that, in, that mean women are placed in a sort of box, not even a bitch box, just a kind of annoying box, which is even worse. Um, and uh, enables men then to sort of say, you know, bloody difficult woman when they leave the room. But I think in answer to your question about uh, the two things when I'm doing my talks, I say is, you know, stop saying sorry. We have this habit of knocking on the door and the first word that comes out of your mouth is sorry. And I say, when you go to work or when you enter the workplace, you're not sorry for anything. You've earned your place there. So don't stop, you know, limit your sorries. How many sorries yeah. you're going to say in a day? Um, it's just one of those things we're socialized into saying. The other one um, I have, sorry, just before we... I had a few, I had always had an intern every week in the lady, and I had one who would knock on my door and say, can I ask you a question? And I'd say, never yeah. say, ask, can I ask you a question? Just come in and ask the question. And then she, and now she's a screenwriter. You know, I mean, not, nothing to do with me, she was talented. But can I ask you a question is, why do you need permission you to ask if you're gonna ask a question? And this is a very womanly thing I was to do. Say, my second one I say to a lot of young people, you don't go to work to be liked. <laughs> you know, I, the next one we go, oh, well, you know, I wonder what's going You don't go to work to be liked. You have your friends and your families and the people who like you. You go to work to do a job and to be productive and to achieve something and to make a difference in the world and to life and to whatever profession. That's what you go to work with. And, and, and you know, you, it, yeah. it's sort of getting rid of, you know, again, going back to, to sociologists in this, is that society socializes us to thinking we should be smiling and we should be, uh, uh, you know, we should be less aggressive and all these sorts of things. And they're all social constructs to limit women. And I think we ourselves have to, we have to have, give ourselves permission not to be, you know, not to conform to those social constructs. Um, and, you know, one of the things I'm noticing, and I'm very wary of in the post-COVID world when everyone's talking about, you know, um, uh, hybrid working or working from home, is presenteeism from the office is now happening at home. And I have lots and lots of, uh, a, 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 a lot of women who are, who are, I call it virtual mansplaining, so that they, they're being left out of Zoom meetings, they're being left out of pictures, they're being, it, it's happening. Because they're working from home. Because they're working from home. Or the excuse that, oh, we won't call her, disturb her now because we know she's got the kids, this is when we were locked down. It's happening at a frightening degree. And a, two thirds of latest um, data, two thirds of women are thinking of either going fully part-time or leaving the workplace or who are professional women. I mean, it is frightening. And I say, you've got to stick in there and fight for the, you know, you have to defend where we are to date. Because this, this, is, this is really quite frightening, what could happen. Um, and, you know, and if you are working more from home, 
How does that, how does your salary then reflect the fact that you've got more bills at home? Okay, you might not be traveling, but you've got more use. You know, there's a long way for this conversation to go. They just take it for granted that it's going to suddenly make your life better. But, but uh, yeah, this virtual man's playing is happening a lot. It's really quite concerning. Well, I'm keen to move on to make some time for audience questions. Do we have any questions? We'll start um, with Gracie in the, in the blue at the front. Um, it's been wonderful to hear you speak because um, I think this is a subject I've been thinking about for a long time as somebody who's often described um, as intense for sharing my, my views frequently and passionately. And I think sometimes, um, especially when women of color, they're termed as aggressive and intense. Um, I think emotion is an important thing to take into account when you're making decisions and when you're sharing your opinions, but it's something that's demonized when women show it because it's seen as such a feminine trait. Do you think that emotion, firstly, is emotion important in decision making? And two, do you think it's particularly demonized for women of color and how do we counter that and how do we take that on? I, I think, I, I think this whole idea, I, I've been asked this question about you know, being brave and strong. I worry that when we, we become strong, we become inflexible. Um, and I think it's really important, actually I try really hard throughout my career, I've tried to stay soft and myself and emotional because I think that means I'm empathetic and I can understand other people. And I've really worked hard, especially again, going back to working in the city, Back in the sort of, you know, I started in, in the 90, 80s and 90s, it was about being strong with big shoulder pads and pinstripe suits in the city. And, you know, that was the yeah. thing. We had to be strong women. Um, and I think it, it, that was a negative. And I don't think it helps us at all. Um, and I think we accept that we have different thought processes. We have different ways of coming to solutions. We, we might have a different prismatic path. But that doesn't mean the solutions we come to are better or worse. They're just different the way we come to them. Um, but I think it's really important that we hold on to our emotions and our empathy and our emotional intelligence is one of the things I think is undervalued. Um, and, and on the race thing, um, I, what is even now surprises me is um, the abuse I get. <laughs> I've, I, I can offend anybody, everybody. It's, it's really quite remarkable. I'll get it from men, black men or, you know, aged men who go, I should shut up and know my place. I'm embarrassing my culture. I get it from you know, white women in the city who go, you know, you should be, you know, we're doing really well, but I'm going, yeah, but you, you're actually the same. You're just like men in skirts. You're just in the same background, same, there, you know, there's no social mobility. So it, it's actually extraordinary. I think you have to be mindful of the fact that people are not, it's not always the people you expect who are going to agree with you or disagree with you and just take it one person at a time and try not to have um, uh, preconceived ideas about how groups of people are going to respond to you. Because it's quite surprising where the, agree is, the people who agree and disagree can come from. So, you know, walk with an open mind and be emotional. But one last thing I'll say is, with women, when we do get emotional, we get high pitched. And so one of my other rules I say is, lower and slower. Always take a breath, lower and slower when you're getting emotional. Just take that. <laughs> <laughs> and a question at the back here um, on the right. And could you stand up when you ask your question so we make sure that the camera can get you? Thank you. Um, we've been talking mainly about the attitudes of men to difficult women. Have you experienced different sorts of abuse from other women to being a difficult woman? <laughs> I, think, I think something that we haven't said uh, so far is that the most important thing that you can do for yourself and for society and for everybody around you is be yourself. Um, and that is what I have been all my life. Um, I have been a politician to a degree as well. I inadvertently got elected to Kensington Council once um, because I thought it would be fun to stand for, stand for a council. I'm, I was at the time a member of the Labour Party and I went to a selection meeting and they, they said, it's all right, you won't get chosen, so don't worry about it. And, and they chose me and I said, um, but you know, I don't want to be a councillor, I just want to be fun to go along with the process. And I was elected. Um, and, but what they said was because um, I have a facility for 
for sounding like an ordinary member of the human race. And um, I don't talk in I don't talk in in riddles. I talk straightforwardly, and I believe in what I'm saying. And I think that is what we should all do, and what we should teach our sons and daughters to do. Our sons, in particular, um, I'm very proud of my son who wears a T-shirt which says. Women, you can't beat them. <laughs> <laughs> that could be read all sorts of ways. <laughs> well, he means it in the right way, I assure you. Otherwise, he wouldn't be allowed. To. Uh, and so that's that's my answer. And uh, no, I don't have I don't have trouble with difficult women. Um, I, I, um, you know, I I, 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 I tend not to notice. I mean. <laughs> Um, I, I can remember once being on a radio programme and my mother rang up as once mothers do um, and she said, I thought you handled all those men really well, darling. <laughs> um, and I didn't, I didn't notice I was the only woman there. But um, So you just be yourself and, and say what you think and teach your sons to do the same and your daughters. Uh, we'll have a question from the lady in the purple mask here and then... Uh from Chen Kai, and then on the end. I just wanted to ask a question about like being liked at work because I I understand obviously you're not it's not a popularity contest but if you're liked you will do better in the workplace I think and I I mean maybe and I also think that there's more of an expectation that a woman has to be likable. A man doesn't have to be likable in the same way in the workplace. What do you think about that? Um, well, I had a rather odd career. I mean, New College Oxford was mostly men. And then I went to the FT. I was the first female graduate trainee. Um, I didn't actually have a woman boss until I left the FT and I went to the BBC. And I therefore... I think operated as a, not as a, it was very different going into a workplace where you are the only female, it really is. And I'm sure you've had a bit of that yourself. You feel much more exposed. You're, mm. I remember somebody taking me aside and saying, we don't wear leggings to the FT. And actually that was quite a good tip. So then I started wearing the next power suits. But when I'd had my first child, I came back to work and you know I was taken aside and said, could you go on a tour of the marginal constituencies? And I said, but my baby's three months old and I'm breastfeeding. And they said, are you ruling yourself out for these sorts of assignments? So, it, you know, my, my sex, my gender was extremely uh, front of mind in my mind. I don't know if it was necessarily front of mind in their mind, but I tried to behave like one of the lads as well. It was, I mean, I don't know what I'm really saying, but I think each single workplace is, is very different. I mean, you were in the city and well, they had a huge say, amount of sexism. Uh, yeah, I mean, even now it's still there. But, um, the, but the question uh, the, wasn't sexism, the, the, it was likability. It's about, it, it about being liked and then sort of, and I think- I wanted <clears> to be liked, but I mean, I was doing things that were going to put me at odds with my employer, I having a maternity leave having, you know, not being able to go on a regional tour, having another maternity leave. These are all things that means you're not really liked. In fact, employers only probably had you because they thought they had to have a woman. Yeah, I, I'd say slightly differently. I, mean, <clears throat> I think you should be yourself. Um, you don't have to go out of your way. You know, it, 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 this idea that you, we all put on a slightly different persona. You even do it when we're answering the work phone. You know, when we're at work, we're a different persona. But trying to be as honest and as true a person is to yourself. It's a lot less hard work, if you like, and you know, less exhausting than trying to be somebody else. But it's not about not being liked. I think it's it's when they, for example, say that you know, if you go in as a young woman, you know, you're expected to make the coffee, whereas the young man coming in is suddenly not, not asked to make the coffee. Oh, it, it still happens now. It still happens now. Absolutely, it does. It does. Um, it, it does all the time. I mean, it's quite I extraordinary. So you say I, no. Like, no, no, they, they say no. I have never made the coffee. No, no, no. I'm just saying, but those sorts of things. And it's not about saying no. I'm not going to say. You know, you say, well, I've done it yesterday. What about asking him today? You know, the ways of yeah. doing it. But I don't, you don't have to be aggressive. I think you do need to speak up. But you don't. It's about the tone you adopt, and I think yeah. it's about fairness and promoting yourself. I mean, I, I'll give you another example. I was asked to by um, uh, one law firm. They run an in-house magazine and a network, female network. And the young woman, she was sort of in, in her mid-30s, was asked to come and interview me. And the day before, the men in the office said, oh, God, I can't believe you're going to go and interview Gina Miller tomorrow. I hope you've had your hair done and you're going to wear a nice dress. 
And she told me this. And I said, why on earth would they say that to you? And I said, it it, is just ridiculous. And I said, and she didn't do it. (laughs) And I said, I'm so pleased you didn't listen to them. And she said, yes, but I nearly did. (laughs) That's why I'm mentioning it to you, because she, it was that expectation that she had to be nice. She had to look a certain way. And, and, you know, I've got, I've got somebody, there's a big company um, in the city, a rating agency, and somebody who's just been made head of research there. She has been told recently that when she, when we go back to doing events, like this and conferences, you know, the women, they put out a note that the women have to wear dresses on stage. And I've said, I can't believe we're in 2021. And they're saying the women in a conference stage have to wear a dress. And I said to her, I hope you just... I would tell them where to get. Yes. Yeah, no, which is what she's done. Hike. But it's, it's just, I mean, the problem is... I was, these... I was sent home for wearing trousers uh, on the Sunday Express in the 1960s. But these are micro-aggressions. <laughs> that was the 1960s. They they're micro they're micro-aggressions and they're still there and you have to call them out. But you don't have to be aggressive in the way you do it. You, and that's what I think I'm saying is that it's a tone. I think being polite and being civil is a way to be and be, be yourself. But that doesn't mean you have to take the shit, basically. <laughs> I, I did have a <laughs> problem. Is that a the, the one problem I had at work was, um, in turn, was when I was made political editor of the Daily Mirror, um, the uh, two male men, m- members of my staff, left the staff because they weren't prepared to work for a woman. Well, too, good luck to them. Yeah, good. Uh, yeah, good. brilliant. <laughs> yeah, I didn't two down. <laughs> Um, but you didn't want them there, they'd have been a no, pain. No, no, it was, fun, I was, it was very much to my advantage in both cases, so I was delighted. Well, actually, I can top that. <laughs> when I was 10, I was sent to an all-boys prep school. Oh, oh yes, I, I know that. <laughs> no, and the headmaster was called Billy Williamson, and I, he refused to teach me, and he refused to teach any class I was in either. Oh, no, there you go. That's that's a badge of honour. <laughs> uh, but I did I did win him round. I have to admit. But this is a slightly self serving anecdote. <laughs> I think we have time for one or two last questions. So we'll go to the Chen Kai was next, and then I think the lady in the flowery mask on the on the right. Uh, first, I thank you for all three of you to coming down in person to share with us your experiences and in, your insights. And I think there's one really interesting observation I want to share with the panel is most of the audience here are women. Uh, that's quite unusual for Oxford Uni event. It's either very gender balanced or at a debate you've got more male dominated attendance. So I wonder, what does the panel have any thoughts on this? Is that the reason people ended up being called difficult women is not many men are listening to them? Uh, I'll tell you my question. When I, when, I first, when I first heard the event uh, Difficult Women, uh, it reminded me of uh, when David Cameron was asked the question whether he'd call himself a feminist, he dodged the question. And in that context, and feminists being used as a label, which is very similar to difficult women. Um, what's the panelist's understanding of being a feminist? And do you think being called a feminist undermined the women's movement? As some people on the cultural debate would dismiss the feminist as being woke. 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 Oh, where do we start? Um, <laughs> where, I want to know where the difficult men are who didn't come to the meeting tonight in order to confront the difficult women. I mean, yeah. I'm me. <laughs> Thank you. Um, how do we define feminists? I, when there's an organisation now called Women in Journalism, when it first came into being, it was called Women in Media. Um, and I went to my first meeting of Women in Media, leaving my then husband at home and came home to discover he, while I'd been out, he'd had a man friend round and formed an organisation called Men in Media, which was um, thoroughly redundant. But he, but he was a feminist. <laughs> um, I, the, 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 I mean, it, it, it speaks for itself, doesn't it? I mean, if you 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 live the life, you prove that you you can do the job, you prove that you're as capable as the man. You you show that that feminism works. And no, no danger at all about being woke. What's woke about that? I mean, I remember women in journalism because I did. I did an event. I mean, I remember when I went home. I, my husband said, "Oh, have you done an event for Whinge, W I J?" <laughs> that was that was it's what still, it was. Yeah, it's it's still right, called right. Whinge. Yeah. I think that um, 
You'd uh, be a member of men in media. I think there was an attempt um, to, um, mainly by men, to attach a derogatory label to the word feminism, which is essentially only means that women should be entitled to the same op opportunities, education and pay and so on, that men are. It's not asking for anything more, it's just asking for the same. And to, wait, to, to be made to feel like you're a screeching harridan when you ask for those things is a very clever trick that the patriarchy, and I, I still use that word because it essentially means that men have most of the power and most of the money and they use it to maintain that system to their advantage uh, because nobody likes to yield the, to the citadel of power to the, in, the marauding hordes. The monstrous regiment of women who came to Oxford, remember that's what, what we were called when we entered this university, the monstrous regiment. It's, you know, our, our encroachment on their uh, sacred territories and entitlements is never going to be easy. So you will be called a feminist and people won't like it, but I'm a proud feminist. I hope my husband's a proud feminist. I brought my boys up to be feminists. And um, I'm very happy to be with two great feminists tonight and very difficult women, I might add. <laughs> Good question. You know, it's a very yeah. good question. I think just a very short bit I'd add on to that is that um, be careful. I mean, language is a, is a powerful weapon um, and it, it is weaponized very often. Um, and I think the word feminist has been weaponized now for, for, for decades. Um, you know, I, I remember having a conversation with, you won't remember, but Body Shop was owned by the incredible Anita Roddick. Uh, and uh, having conversation with her about being a businesswoman trying to do things differently. At the time we were talking about responsible capitalism all the way back in the 90s, um, and now it's called ESG. It's suddenly become popular. We were talking about it a long time ago. Um, and we were seen as not just difficult women then, we were seen as pathetic women because we were t talking about mama and papa type businesses that nobody take it seriously, that we weren't aggressive enough, funny enough, rather than being too aggressive. We didn't understand the business was about being aggressive. Um, and language, a lot of language was used against us at that time when we were talking. And the whole idea of being feminist and who would want female only products and who would, you know, it was, it's the way language is appropriated. And I think we need to just move beyond it. And I'd say the day we're not walking around, as a, me as a woman of color, I'm not walking around with two tags weighing down my legs. One is the fact that I'm a woman and the other one is a woman of color. Then I don't have to think about language. But right now, I need language that will allow me to point to the fact that I walk around every day with two weights around my ankle. Um, for our final question, the lady in the flowery mask on the... Thank you so much for everything that we've been talking about tonight. I find it very interesting. I would just really like to ask a question about a comment made um, that doesn't happen anymore um, in with regards to making coffee and things like that. So um, I feel very comfortable calling out men for being misogynistic. I feel perfectly within my right. A problem I face is when women discount other women's experiences because they don't match their own. I was wondering if you had any advice with how you would negotiate that, um, given that the dynamics are very different. Ooh, where to start? Um. <laughs> Uh, journalism, journalism is, is a fortunate trade to have been in because actually my experience, even from 50 years ago, was that, that women, women were, were treated the same and paid the same and, and we all made the coffee. Um, I, I have always ignored sexual abuse and that was around a great deal and I and I'm sure it is I know it is still good cough sorry <coughs> um I went to I went to a reunion of my first newspaper um about five years ago um and somebody told me that um there was an elderly sub editor um who I didn't get on with and who had said to all the men on we were we were we were all underpaid, but then we were all equally underpaid. The men and women were all equally underpaid. And the newspaper in question was the Portsmouth Evening News. We had a circulation then which is the size of, of the 
practically the Daily Mirror today. I mean, it was over 100,000 um, every day. <coughs> but this, and there were, there were a, a, a lot of men and women trainees, and we did all the work. And this sub had said to one of, one of our, men, our men colleagues, when, he, when is somebody going to get that woman pregnant um, so that uh, get her off our backs? And I, I had no idea of that. And I was absolutely delighted to hear about this. But I wished I'd known about it at the time because I would have gone and said something to him. And, <laughs> um, what would you have said? <laughs> I, would, I would have said, I hear you've been saying this, and, and, and would you like to come with me and say it to the editor? Well, but don't forget that for, for many years, I mean, companies I and mean, employers <laughs> don't even want to hire women of childbearing age because, you know, they know that they're going to have to pay their maternity leaves. It didn't you know, happen in, in newspapers, in my experience. Really? Yeah. No, I'm not in political journalism, really. But I did... I, I, I had my children extremely late, I have to say. I covered the Sarah Everard murder for a few hours, obviously, in the radio. And what I found, actually, was the commonality of the experience, of, of the female experience. And, I mean, I could have taken a million calls on women saying, this happened to me in the street, this happened when I was this, and when... Uh, and I had my own stories as well, but I wanted to hear from, from the listeners and the callers. Um, I, I, I feel that there are moments when women really do. I mean, that was an extraordinary Me Too moment about uh, violence, and not, not domestic violence, but street violence, the, the lived experience of girl. What was so sad? Girls as well as women. And I remember, and I remember, it made me remember, I told my own daughter when she was 14 and going to day school in Hammersmith on her own for the first time, you know, if you're coming back, walk in the middle of the road, hold your keys, you know, all these things that my mother had told me. And so there are also very bonding experiences as well as ones which divide. And that was one of them. And it happened to be a great tragedy as well. Can I say something on this that um, I think... We can't expect all women to, it's just like you can't expect any yeah, group of people to all be exactly yeah. the same and to have had the same experiences. But I'd also caution and say that I'm coming across a lot of women who haven't quite come to terms with themselves, the fact that they have men got, may have gone through these experiences and either shut them out or haven't dealt with the emotional, it, it, you know, impact of what they may have experienced. So what they do is they react by shutting it out. And I think we just need to be kind to each other, that there is a realization that through generations, women may have been experiencing these um, aggressions and they haven't really been able to talk about them, they have buried them. But we've been and told that's to about, expect them as well. But, but, but it's the thing, and, and oh, we've been told to expect them. I, I went through, I mean, I didn't finish my law degree. I'm, I actually don't work in law. I didn't finish my law degree because I was attacked by a group of men at university. Um, and at that time, we couldn't talk about it because nobody believed you. It was something that I was told um, not only would I be believed, but it, I must have done something. You know, it's all those sorts of things. And so we have to understand that people go through different stages, a bit of different stages of mourning. People go through different stages of coming to terms with their own experiences and have different reactions to them. So I think it's sort of you being the bigger person and moving on to find somebody else who may be able to be, who is in the same place as you, and then forming that sisterhood and being there that when the other person is maybe ready to come and join you, they will do. But it's forming a place where people can come and seek help and succor and kindness. And I'd say, start, don't expect everyone to come at once, but create the homes where they can come and find you, if that makes sense. Well, on that note, we do unfortunately have to finish, but it's a, a good note to end. Uh, Gina, Julia and, and Rachel, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Uh, thank you all for joining us as well. Do make sure to come again tomorrow to see Soma Sara, uh, the founder of Everyone's Invited, um, and have a lovely evening. Thank you. Wow.